Turner. Welcome to the Virtual Lens Summit. Uh, this is probably our 12th or 13th. I've got to start counting and populate them on our website. I haven't done that with previous uh, recordings. That's on my to-do list. Today we have Atlas Lens Company, Forrest Schultz and Dan Keynes. And uh, you know, the first time I heard about Atlas was at two, in 2017 at NAB. There's a story about this new company in the Tiffin booth that had these a prototype, I think it was a 40 millimeter? 65. Or 65 millimeter yeah, anamorphic lens. And uh, the story was that a couple years before, Forrest was taking apart lenses in his kitchen. And then two years later, he's got a working prototype of an anamorphic lens. And so that was sort of a mind boggling thought with the complexity of lens design and manufacture. And uh, then they were taking deposits for the first sets, the first set of three, uh, or the pro I think the first set of three were the first ones to be delivered. And then uh, you could also put the deposit down for the whole set. And you could either you know, pre-order for one or you could pre-order a set for of three. Oh, for the three. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, the yeah. next three were the this, this, this second part of the set. But anyway, it was really impressive. And it was sort of a, sort of a model taken after red, how they did deposits for their red ones and stuff and pre-orders. And it was sort of a crowdfunding effort and uh, definitely a new business model for uh, our current age. So anyway, um, let's get it going and uh, welcome. Hi everyone out there, thanks for joining us. I'm Dan Keynes. And I'm Forrest Schultz. And we're from Atlas Lens Co. And uh, thank you so much for ho hosting us today, Michael for the Pacific Northwest Lens Summit uh, Virtual Edition 2020. So um, yeah, we have a special treat in store for you today. Uh, I'd like to take one moment to just highlight and acknowledge the fact that today is uh, June 19th or in America, Juneteenth. So I have no intention to sit up here and pretend that I'm an expert on this, but what I do know is the first time I was exposed to the idea of Juneteenth was watching uh, the great show Atlanta, which is, um, you know, Donald Glover's show. I don't know if anyone else there has seen it. Have you seen uh, Atlanta yet? I've heard of it. I haven't watched it yet. It's, first of all, the cinematography is fantastic. The storytelling is fantastic. And that was actually my first personal exposure as an adult to the idea of Juneteenth, which is um, a day that we should remember as, you know, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, federal agents had to go down to Texas and put a final end to slavery and make sure that, you know, people were, were freed. Um, you know, it's terrible that our country was engaged in slavery. Uh, and I think that, you know, I just want to take a moment to honor all the different kinds of people that make up America and that, you know, are part of the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's really important to me to just take this moment and, and honor uh, some of the people that have touched me personally in my life, um, people who are different than me. I didn't grow up uh, exposed to a lot of different people of color, but uh, as a young, as a young person, watching TV and seeing people like RuPaul who are so different than me. Um, you know, not only a black man, but also a black man, woman. You know, I, I don't want to speak for Ru, but Ru influenced me and, and showed me that you can be whoever you want to be if you believe in yourself and if you put out the right energy. And um, that's something that's important to me in cinematography is that we have the privilege as cinematographers to change things to transform the world through images and um, cinematographers like Bradford Young ASC, uh, Bill Dill ASC, Johnny Simmons ASC. These are people who have influenced and inspired me in my life and I uh, just wanted to take a moment to celebrate uh, black Americans and people of all color around the world and people of all gender, uh, race, ethnicity, bias, um, we love all people. So I just want to take a moment to celebrate everyone, especially during Pride Month and especially during, um, you know, crazy pandemic that's, that's facing the whole world right now. And I think that it took a pandemic like this to highlight just how important it is that we come together as human beings. 
so you know that's um that's enough of me on the podium for that for the moment but i just want to say um you know, here's a proverb that's attributed to both Voltaire and uh, Spider-Man's uncle, who I don't think it's any coincidence, his name is Uncle Ben. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So I think as image makers, as people that make lenses, we have a responsibility, not just a privilege, but also a responsibility to take care of the world, take care of other human beings and make it a better place. Uh, so allow me, if you will, to bring you on a journey with us today, looking back through history, uh, because I think it's really important to not only understand where we are today, but to really truly understand where we are today and who we are today. It's important to look through the lens of the past to see why things were, how they became the way they are now. And I'd also like to highlight that um, in the presentation we're going to give today, we're going to cover some really interesting ideas. And um, I've been told that some of these ideas are very closely related to some of the presentations from Bill Dill, ASC, um, highlighting the way that different groups of people are interconnected and that different things are interconnected with invisible strings. So that's what I love about optics is that optics are where the tangible meets the intangible. And that's, uh, science and magic at the same time. So thank you for that moment. And uh, if it's okay, I'm gonna start our presentation. Okay, so today's presentation is called Anamorphic Lens History, Commerce, Technology and Artistry or Third Order Consequences of a Cinematic Kind. And we're gonna carry you through history through the lens and show how business, technology, and artistry are all interconnected by invisible strings that have brought forth uh, great opportunities and experiences that we witness today in ways that are often unexpected and surprising. So just wanna highlight three key aspects of filmmaking, commerce, the financial engine that drives our artistic medium, technology. Um, filmmaking is inherently a technical medium. It's not something you can do with a brush and paint, although those can help. Um, you're gonna need some technology in order to make a film. And artistry. So, you know, artistry is our opportunity to present the world in a true way or to transform the world with our own truth and to perhaps make a better world than it really is. Um, and all three of these aspects, these different layers connect with invisible strings. So there are unexpected consequences that can often become beautiful, uh, disastrous for some, beautiful for others. Um, and it's often through suffering that we can create the most beautiful art or the most interesting results that we just don't know. So it's hard to predict what's next, but we can always look back at the past. So let's start by first defining what is an anamorphic lens and why does it exist? An anamorphic lens is a lens that uses cylindrical optics to intentionally distort incoming light rays to capture an asymmetrical horizontal and vertical field of view. And the same goes when you're projecting or presenting an image. You're taking an asymmetrical field of view and projecting it back out to become normalized or, you know, contemporaneous to what we see in real life. Uh, the distortion created by an anamorphic lens has both technical limitations and potential artistic advantages. Um, so, you know, the reason that it exists is to fit a widescreen image onto a square piece of film. And I'm gonna get into that in a moment, why? But I just wanna showcase how business has influenced technology. So imagine if you will, it's mid-century Hollywood and less people are going to the movies than ever. Most people are staying home to watch entertainment on a new square box called television. And this is creating a big problem for major movie 
major movie studios and theater chains, they're seeing a big decline in revenue and less interest in movies. So, you know, the studios got together and they said, how is it we can get audiences to leave their homes and come back out? And they looked at what was popular and trendy at the time. And they noticed that people were really into stereo surround sound and hi-fi. And I might argue that this is a precursor to virtual reality or augmented reality. So you're immersed in the experience of sound or vision. And they said, well, if we create a spectacle that makes you feel like you're in a movie, you're more likely to leave your house, go out, buy some popcorn, buy a soda, have a hot dog, bring your family and witness something unbelievable that you just can't do at home. So it's an, you know, almost an out of body experience. And the first solution that was uh, developed as a technical answer to this business need was Cinerama and formats like Cinerama. So you would use either two or three cameras uh, running side by side to capture a panoramic view. And that would be on normal square film. And then, you know, a few other things they tried would be like larger format film. But once you have a larger piece of film, you start getting wag in the film gate. So you get depth of field issues, registration issues where the film would jitter and judder. And running three cameras and three projectors is enormously expensive, two to three times more expensive. Um, but they did manage to make a few Cinerama films. And of course, they'd also make some, you know, VistaVision large format films. And generally, the reaction was good. People started going back to the theater to see these widescreen movies. So the business units at the studio said, okay, we're seeing some positive results here. People will come back to the movies if there's enough spectacle. But no one wants to pay to run three cameras with three strips of film. And studio and theater houses don't want to have more projectors and rent more film and have more problems with synchronization. So this is a case where the business influenced the technology and they said, we have to come up with a cheaper way to do this. So one of the first studios to come up with a solution was Fox and the head of Fox and the technical director of Fox flew to France and met with a man named Henri Chrétien. And Chrétien had developed something he called the Anamorphos or, or Anamorphot. And initially he'd created this technology for monocular viewfinders in periscopes uh, for army tanks during World War I so that you could look through a monocular viewfinder and see who's coming left or right of your tank because it was too expensive to make a binocular system uh, for most of the tanks at that time. So Chrétien had developed this technology to get a wider field of view into a normal viewing uh, angle. And he'd early on tried to make movies or influence people to make movies in France uh, with Pathé Studios, but they just thought, you know, this is kind of crazy. We don't really need this stuff. But he held the patent and Earl Sponable and Spiros Skuris from Fox flew to France, met with Chrétien as his patent was about to expire and secured licensing rights to bring that technology back to America, work with Bosch and Loam and develop uh, anamorphic adapter lens so that they could put the lens on the camera, get a widescreen field of view onto a square strip of film, and then use a similar lens on the projector side to project back out wide again. So the image that actually goes onto the film ends up being skinny. If you've ever seen an anamorphic negative or if you've looked at a digital cinema camera with an anamorphic lens on with the de-squeeze turned off, everything's going to be squished and skinny. So you're you're fitting all that wide stuff into a nice square format. So Fox worked with Bosch and Loam. They developed these adapter lenses and this created some problems for camera people. When you have two lenses, like an adapter system like that, you're gonna to have to focus your prime lens and then you're gonna to have to focus the adapter at the same time. And that's really inconvenient because it's already hard enough to maintain a set and focus one lens let alone two at the same time with all the other responsibilities you have. So that was really frustrating for camera people. And that's an example of camera people influencing the technology. So they went back to Bosch and Loam and Fox and said, these adapters, I mean, we can make movies like this, but 
it's not really working out so great. So is there something you can do to make it easier? And Wash and Loan went back to the drawing board, like in our slides here, and started working on a solution to integrate an anamorphic system with a taking lens and have a coupled focus system. And the result of that was uh, the technical Oscar award-winning Wash and Loam Cinemascope Baltars. So you can see we have some advertising art from IBM here uh, showcasing that same Bosch and Loam Baltar lens, just like this gentleman's holding on the left. And these are amazing lenses. I don't know if anyone here has ever had a chance to see them in real life or put hands on them, but each lens has its own dedicated built-in follow focus system. And each one weighs about 40 pounds, <laughs> no joke. Um, so there are these amazing cast iron lens bodies with two lens systems that are coupled and they're focusing with a built-in follow focus. And these were used on these huge Mitchell rack over cameras. So uh, large lenses and large cameras were no stranger to the people making movies in the mid 1950s. Uh, and they'd have to blimp them oftentimes too. So you'd have, you know, big bunches of foam to try to keep the sound inside of the lens and the camera. So this is a case of uh, artists influencing the technology and actually revising something that had started as a business interest. And that fed back into some changes that then resulted into even more changes, which we'll get into in a minute. But um, you can see the beginning of how something starts as a business decision quickly becomes a technical decision. And then that has consequences for the artists. So with those new Bosch and Loam integrated CinemaScope Baltars, there were a few new problems that arose. Um, whenever you do a close-up of someone, the anamorphic coefficient of the lens would actually reduce. So you'd have less squeeze the closer focus you got. And it would often make people's faces look mumpy, for lack of a better term. You'd have kind of a distorted, squatty face. Um, and you can see in the example image here, here's a young lady who's being photographed with a standard lens. And then on the left you have with CinemaScope in close up. So this is another case where the artist said, this is not really working out. Is there something we can do to change this technology to make it better? I mean, we love that we're, we have jobs again, we're able to go back and make mo more movies for you guys in the studios, but um, this has had unexpected consequences that we didn't take into account when we started. So, enter Panavision and Robert Gottschlock and his team. So, camera people started to complain. They knew that Gottschlock had been making anamorphic projector lenses because Bosch and Loam and some other companies couldn't keep up with the demand for CinemaScope projection. So, Panavision, which had started as a small camera store, started manufacturing projection lenses using prisms and cylindrical optics. Uh, as a solution. And camera people would often visit uh, Mr. Gottschlock's shop and his store and would say, you know, I'm having this problem with these mumps. Is there anything that we could possibly do to change this? And people would be tinkering in their shop. And one day, the, sto the legend has it that one day, um, Gottschlock and one of his technicians were looking through two pieces of cylindrical optics and you know, looking through them and twisting them. And they noticed that as they twisted the two optics relative to one another, uh, the anamorphic coefficient would change. So you'd actually get more squeeze or less squeeze depending on how they twisted to each other, right? Mm -hmm. So they noticed this and they thought, well, maybe if we place this into one of the Bosch and Lone Baltar lenses, there's a way that we can correct for this as they move into close up. These two cylinders can also correlate and then correct for this problem. So um, Gottschalk and one of his technicians, whose name was Tack, they began working on figuring out a way to integrate this together with those Bosch and Loam lenses and make it a Panavision product. So they ended up getting a hold of some of the Bosch and Loam lenses that were not desired by the studios as much, reworked them. And this is, uh, as legend has it, the introduction of the first auto Panatar lenses, which are the first CinemaScope lenses that would correct for widescreen close-ups so you don't have mumps. Um, so that was a pretty interesting and fascinating 
case where the artists influence the technology. And over the last 50 years or more, um, Panavision, because of this, really became the dominant choice for anamorphic filmmaking. And let us not forget that, you know, Panavision and Bosch and Lohm and the people in America were not the only people making anamorphic lenses. Uh, during the Cold War, there was a race for technology that's not only um, for technology's sake, but a way of influencing culture. So the Soviet Russians put together uh, their own anamorphic lenses with their state-run movie production studio and engineering system. And at the same time, uh, post-war Japan was also very interested in addressing a growing consumer market. And companies like Kawa were also developing and manufacturing anamorphic projection and taking lenses for cinematography. So North America was not the only place that widescreen movies were being made and projected. It was a worldwide phenomenon. So now I'd like to talk for a moment about how technology really has affected the artistry. Um, as we said, over the last 50 year, years or more, um, a tremendous number of anamorphic films have been made. And despite the technical improvements created by Panavision, anamorphic imaging still has its own unique set of imperfections that create a signature look. And I would argue that anamorphic is now the native language of cinema. We've all seen so many anamorphic films um, that it really is part of our lexicon and part of what we think of when we think of a movie. Chances are we might be thinking of anamorphic imaging. And <clears throat> we like to call some of these imperfections in the lenses tool marks. So some of those traditional tool marks that result as a unintended technical consequence are things like uh, oval bokeh in the out-of-focus areas, streak flares, and things like astigmatism, coma, chromatic, and spherical aberration. So all these things that, you know, an engineer might say, well, you can't have those because they're imperfect, and in a sense they're right, um, actually became directly part of what we experience watching films. And they're sort of like you know, like tape hiss, if you're listening to a recorded tape and there's something that's just not quite perfect about it, but it makes you fall in love with it just that much more, uh, or tube amplifiers. So for those who love cinema, I would say it's a very similar thing or comparable. So that's a little bit of the history of how um, anamorphic lens imaging came to be and why it came to be. And now, briefly, we'd love to talk about how Ana Atlas Lens Co. came to be um, and our mission, which is to create anamorphic lenses for all people. So this is a case where artistry has then come back around and pulled a string and influenced business because uh, both Forrest and I are artists and technologists, but um, I would say foremost artists, I mean, uh, I grew up loving photography, loving films, uh, watched a lot of films from the 70s and 80s and even as far back as the 30s. But, um, you know, grew up, grew up watching a lot of 60s, 70s and 80s films that were primarily shot in anamorphic. And that inspired me to want at a very young age to become a cinematographer. And I would say that um, the first film that really made me snap out of reality and say, whoa, what is doing this? Why is it like this? And actually start asking questions about the world I live in uh, would probably be Paul Thomas Anderson and Robert Ellsworth's work on um, Punch Drunk Love. So that film influenced me enough to say, okay, there's something about this that is so different. Why does this film look like this? I have to learn what is making it like this. And then I realized, all the films I love, almost all the films I love are anamorphic. Um, so for us, you know, love to hear a little bit from yeah, you about your influences. Yeah, for myself, I've always felt like the music and film was something that stuck with me. I think it's the merging of the sound, uh, so the, this, the audio and the visual, that even at a young age, I remember humming, you know, soundtracks to films and thinking about the way it made me feel while I was there watching it. I feel like that connected with me in a way where you know, 
on a personal level, it just made me want to be involved in some of that process. Um, I also put there, um, you know, my father, I think an influence for the creativity, the design um, comes from him or this side of it, because at an early age, I, he was, my dad's a contractor and uh, I remember him always talking to me. He worked with his father and basically at some age, he'd said he, he wanted to be an architect. He always, he was actually doing a lot of sketching, drawing, wanting to go to school, but that kind of got interrupted because work became a thing that, you know, the family needed. So he just kept, he kept with the contracting business. And he remembers telling, I remember him telling me he wished he had, you know, ventured down that path a little bit more that he had went towards that direction. And I think that stuck with me at an early age that you have to do what you really want to do. Um, despite, you know, the challenges and despite not knowing what may happen. So his, you know, his passion and that, that for, for sketching, for design, for he has, you know, unique ability to see a problem and figure out a new way to engineer some solution for it. And I always respected, admired that. And so I think a lot of that kind of is what influenced me into this process of, um, you know, I guess wanting to build lenses and learning how to do it, not being afraid to take that risk. Uh, for films, for anamorphic uh, specifically, I think Batman Begins was one I pulled up because I just I remember, I, I remember at that age, you know, going into the theater thinking this movie is going to be about Batman. I'm not going to take it too seriously because I'd seen the stuff before, right? And I kind of thought this is how I'm going to feel watching a movie about Batman, um, seeing some of his predecessors that weren't taken too seriously. Um, but something about it made me feel like this is a movie. And I think that, as Dan said, it brought back, this is reminiscent of movies I've watched in my childhood, things that I took seriously, the storyline, things kind of just merge. And I remember noticing what's distinct about this movie. There's something different. Um, even, even though I wasn't looking for it, I probably recognized some of those out of focus areas and, you know, signatures of anamorphic, um, also killing them softly, um, Greg Fraser ASC. I, I remember reading about that one and watching that distinctly looking for those traits of anamorphic because they're very much in your face. You can't watch that movie without saying, you know, this was shot on anamorphic. Um, it, once, it, once your brain becomes attuned to it, do you find it's kind of hard to turn it off? Like now I yeah. go see movies. <laughs> I mean, before the pandemic, I was going to the movie theater and I'd watch movies and be going, okay there's a little too much chromatic aberration there. What about that bokeh? The bokeh's chopped here. Why is that? What lenses are they using? Yeah. So it's kind of fun, but, um, you know, it's also kind of a monomania that um, it's hard to turn off sometimes. So wish I could and just sometimes enjoy the story more, but um, love the lenses too much. So, yeah. So, you know, coming back around again to talk about how the conditions that um, we grew into as artists and as technologists um, influenced us to start this business. We were sitting there in 2015 and I know Forrest was, you know, experimenting um, at home with a lot of different things. I had just left a business that I'd started uh, making HD video transmitters and had never given up my cinematography career. And I was thinking, man, I really love to own a set of anamorphic lenses. So we're in this condition where the cinema business has changed, technology has changed, artistry has changed significantly, like big changes in our lifetimes even, um, the transition from film to digital primarily. Um, so we're sitting there going, why hasn't the cine lens business changed? All these other things have changed. So I was considering buying a set of anamorphic lenses and I looked what's in the market and it's like, yeah, I could buy a really beat up used set of Koas for $85,000 that may or may not work a month into using them and renting them out to people. Uh, or I could get, you know, try to piece together a set of Lomos, which have these beautiful imagery, but just without some kind of, total rehousing and even with a total rehousing sometimes you can't always depend on the mechanics to hold up so we were entering into a world where as cinematographers our needs weren't being fully addressed um, 
we wanted to have something that would create vintage lens characteristics, but that would be dependable, reliable, and robust. And, you know, if you looked at the marketplace, anamorphic lenses typically would rent for more money. So if you were willing to take the risk on something like a Koa set or Lomo set, the opportunity to have reward for taking that risk was pretty high. So he was experimenting and I was like, oh man, I, I don't know if I want to buy a set of lenses that are not that dependable. And then I thought back and I'd been experimenting in, in a similar way to Forrest, you know, taking old projector lenses and photography lenses and modifying them. Um, you know, after I'd seen Punch Drunk Love, I was like, wow, I can't afford a cinema camera. I definitely can't afford an anamorphic lens. And this is when you could get Lomo lenses for $500, you know, in the early 2000s. I couldn't afford $500, but I wanted to make photography, still photography that looked like a film because that was what I had access to and could afford. And I'd been experimenting with um, putting projector lenses in front of my stills camera. I had a old Minolta um, X, I think it was like X-T1 or something, Minolta. And I would put a projector lens in front of it and take a portrait of my friends and then develop the film and then use Photoshop to de-squeeze it. And I thought that was just the coolest thing. And I, I was looking online to see who was kind of interested in these same kind of ideas of building something new and you know starting in a DIY way. And like all good romances these days, uh, Forrest and I met online. So he was on the forums, I was on the forums. I saw you know some of the incredible things Forrest was doing with very little resources in his kitchen, putting together these awesome short films uh, using modified projector lenses and stills lenses. And I was like, the spirit of what this guy is doing is awesome. It really touches me in terms of thinking like a pioneer and just taking action, not waiting for things to change for me. And uh, I thought, you know, I could try to afford a set of master anamorphics, but I'm not going to be happy because it's actually more perfect than the kind of vintage feeling lenses I want or I could get these old, spend money on these old vintage lenses and not be sure I can get a good result from them. Or I could try to take the money I wanted to put into my own set of lenses and then actually work with a real pioneer like Forrest and together the two of us can put together a company. So, you know, I think it's really important to define the philosophy. And when we first started talking, we took a lot of time to really figure out why we were doing this, you know, what it is that we really wanted out of it. So we, we first asked ourselves, well, why do we want anamorphic lenses? And it helps to understand the benefits of anamorphic lenses to really know why. So with an anamorphic lens, you really get two fields of view with any one lens. And that's just something that as a hacker mindset person, I really love. If you can have one lens and get two different fields of view, you're getting more than you could with a normal lens. So why not get more for less? Um, the perspective magnification feels more human in our opinion. I mean, you know, as most of us, if we're fortunate enough, we have binocular vision. So our two eyes are working kind of like those Cinerama systems where we're getting two combined pictures and getting a wider field of view. Um, so, Okay. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say naturally, I, I started thinking about this. Naturally, you have a brow, you have the, you know, the ridge and your cheekbone that sort of mask you, your ability to see up and down as much as you can see left and right. So in a really true way, you do have sort of a panoramic view um, akin to you know, widescreen cinematography. If we had four eyes, we'd probably have to make four times anamorphic <laughs> lenses, but biology you know, if we're lucky to have both eyes working, we have binocular vision. So I think that's kind of how we ended up with CinemaScope generally. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a more human imaging system. Um, you can fit more story in any given frame. So you can have something happening in the foreground and something else happening in the background telling a sub story. And I think that's a fantastic tool for any artist. Um, and then of course the things that, you know, get highlighted often are the tool marks that anamorphic lenses leave. As we mentioned before, things like the oval bokeh, the great flares, astigmatism and coma, you know, things that are technical imperfections, but somehow bring us closer to the reality that we all live in through the lens. So 
and then we said, well, why, why are we starting this company? Why is this important to us? Um, it's important to us because we use lenses. So it's not just like, let's make something for other people to enjoy. We actually love using the lenses ourselves. So it's going to be that much more personal. Um, we like vintage lens characteristics, but we need modern conveniences if we're going to work on a professional film set. So while you can do great things with a DIY setup, we found that there's a need for professional level reliability, dependability, and stability. And we wanted to bring together a set of lenses that have balanced characteristics. So something that's not um, just like an effects lens that you only use for certain con conditions, something that could really hopefully last a lifetime and be used on almost any type of film uh, that a cinematographer or director wants to make. So whether it's a modern film or a vintage film, um, something that has characteristics for all parties, both parties. And we put our hearts and soul into this. I mean, we really went deep in terms of trying to make this happen and make it a reality. So that for you, <laughs> I think that's really important to, you know, making it a reality. And that's why we're not just uh, thinking about it and then leaving it as an unfinished dream. As Boris said, you know, it's, it's important to dream, but it's also important to reach all the way for the dream and go for it. So I would encourage anyone out there watching, if you have a dream, do your best to go for it and we're here to support you. So one of the questions we love to hear is, how did you do this? Uh, and as I said, you know, we really started from the philosophical level asking why. And if you have the right why, reasons why, you can figure out who, how, what, and when. And our why was clear, cinematographers need this kind of product. And then we asked, well, which cinematographers? We want to make something that's good for all cinematographers as a democratizing tool. And we wanna make the people's lens. So it needs to be standardized, repeatable, and accessible to a wider range of people. And from those, um, aspects, we said, well, how can we do this? So we thought the key is focus on something that's stable, scalable, and manufacturable uh, that stays true to the ideals that we're trying to bring forth, which is uh, something that, that balances vintage characteristics and modern characteristics. And we really put a lot of passion, grit, and determination into the lenses. So the only question left for us after creating this funnel of thinking and philosophy was to say when. And it was really important to us that we don't announce anything to the world until we have something that we are proud of and that we believe is representative of, if not the actual final product, representative of what we're trying to bring forth. So we focused all our energy once we'd figured all this stuff out into figuring out when and how. So we started literally in a garage um, both of us had some experience doing DIY lens assembling using a variety of components, but we knew that there's no way that you can scale something well if you're just buying other people's lenses, taking them apart, and then rebuilding them. And we looked at what people in the DIY community were doing. We loved that, and we thought that was fantastic, but we wanted to make something that was more stable and really for professional-grade cinematography. So, but we also want to make it affordable. So we talked about doing an adapter, but we realized that an adapter is just going to be an opportunity for more people to find more problems with the system instead of find the best results and let the technology get out of the way of their artistry. So I've been researching um, wearable AR glasses a lot because I was really into drones at the time. And I'd become friends with this great company in the Bay Area called Avagon. And their CEO, Dr. Alan Evans. And I'd taken my drone up there to the Bay Area and spent a couple afternoons flying around with them at their company picnic and really getting to know their team. And they were really nice people. And Forrest also got to meet Dr. Evans. And um, we had a great time. And, and I told him, hey, I'm thinking about starting this lens company. Um, you know. I don't really have experience designing optics, but I do have experience designing products. Who, like, who do you like to work with with, with optics? 
And I was fortunate enough to get a great answer from Dr. Evans, which was he had been working with uh, Scott DeWald, who was formerly a technical VP at Schneider and who trained under some of the masters at ISCO and who also was, um, you know, deeply experienced in working with some of the Japanese manufacturers like Minolta. So we started talking and I remember the first time uh, Forrest and I got on a call with Scott and literally we're on this conference call and, uh, you know, we're polite, you know, we're polite young guys. So we're like, Hey Scott, how are you doing? I hope it's an okay time to call. And he goes, well, I'm barbecuing. There's like a long pause after yeah, that. Yeah, it was a deep we pause. Like, are we in trouble? I guess. Like, we gotta wait. Well, hopefully we didn't piss this guy off too bad. But sure enough, uh, he was smoking some meats. He was smoking some meats. Yeah, yeah. like the Zucker Zuck, Zuck Droid. He's probably listening. Um, jokes. Uh, but you know, Scott is a tremendous guy, and um, like many great engineers, just a little bit socially awkward at times, but after really getting to know him, we became great friends. And he, we were, we were lucky enough to find someone that experienced who was willing to help us and get on board with our project. So uh, not soon after, not too long after that, Forrest had been working on the product design for a while. Even before I met Forrest, Forrest had been doing this awesome product design uh, for what he thought the lenses should look like. And then uh, Forrest and Scott worked together. You know, Forrest had taught himself ZMAX. And Scott also happened to be running the same version of ZMAX, which is like, you know, over 10 year old software version. But they both bonded over this older version of the software and, and really hit it off and started cranking on the optical design. And, um, you know, I focused on product management because as a cinematographer who'd been working in the field, I had a lot of ideas about what I knew camera assistants and cinematographers really needed out of a lens. So we did things like make sure that the iris and focus gears were in the right place and that they were uniformly spaced away from the system and the specs, you know, thinking about the specs that people wanted and also working together with Forrest to really define the look that we wanted, which was something that would be uniquely a blend between classic vintage looks with you know a little bit of spherical aberration softness when you're wide open but when you stop down it really sharpens up a lot uh, we had to have streak flares that would be kind of like light teal blue hopefully and um you know the bokeh was important and we knew what we wanted out of them and we we set to work figuring out how to achieve all these things in a way that would be easily manufactured easily repaired and serviceable in the field if something goes wrong. So it was really important to us that these are a product that can survive harsh environments and hopefully give people a lifetime of great use. Um, so we focused all of our attention and energy on making a sin single minimum viable product to showcase, hey, we can do this, it's totally possible. And that it also ticks all the boxes of what we need out of the lens. So we, we set to work designing and building this prototype and we were running in full stealth mode right up until NAB 2017, where we surprised the world. But, uh, you know, there's always a ton of uncertainty in these things. And because it was our first lens build, there were unexpected things that happened along the way. I mean, going as far as like, we finished the builds at the very last minute, but it's literally two days before the show starts. And we're like, okay, let's, um, let's show these lenses to some of the cinematographers we know. So, mm -hmm. you know, I texted uh, Christopher Probst ASC and I'm like, I know you like anamorphic lenses. Uh, would you mind coming to check out this thing for us and I've been working on? And he was like, yeah, I'll be right there. You're up in Sun Valley. So I, I had friends at this rental house called DFS. So we were, you know, we set up some string lights. We set up a lighting setup with a stool. Um, my wife came down and was our model for the day and my dog, Eddie, and um, we, we set up this little setup to show off to a few people and just to gauge their reaction and people were blown away. But that same day we realized, yeah, the wings on the Alexa PL mount stick out a little bit more than we thought they did based on the specs that we had. 
So we couldn't fit the lens on an Alexa. We can only fit it on the red cameras because there's no long wings on the PL mount. So we're like, oh man, we got to take this thing apart and then lay it down at the last minute to just make it fit on the Alexa as well as the red for the show. So, you know, it all comes down to this sort of last minute. I like to always think most of what we do, you know, we do a lot to make sure that we preload 90% that we're going to get things done. But that last 10% is always what I call the Indiana Jones moment where we're, there's this giant stone door coming down. It's going to crush us and our hat falls off. And then we slide under the door and we just pull the hat through and we make it. And that's, I mean, it's been four years of that feeling. And I'll tell you, I still love every minute of it. It's, it I don't know about you, but it's a wild ride. Every, every day is a wild ride, but it's still, I wouldn't trade it for anything. So it was fun because, you know, showing up, um, I'd worked out a deal with Tiffin where they were going to host us for free, essentially. Um, I convinced them, I said, hey, I know you guys want more traffic in your booth. So imagine if there's a new lens company, what goes better with a new lens than filters? So we'll be happy to help showcase your filters for free with our lenses. And they were like, kid, you sound crazy, but sure, we'll let you in. So we managed to get a free booth space at NAB 2017. So I want to thank everyone at Tiffin, uh, Steve Tiffin, Andrew Tiffin, uh, Mike, all the people from Tiffin who were so kind to host us free of charge. You know, we, we were basically eating ramen uh, in order to make sure that we could afford to do what we did. And uh, they were so kind to host us. So, yeah. of course, there were unintended consequences from that too, where people said, so is this a Tiffin company? Does Tiffin own you guys? No, you know, Tiffin doesn't own us. We love Tiffin. Um, in fact, we're still leasing space from Tiffin and that's where you can come see us in Burbank these days. Um, they're great people, they make great filters and they're great landlords and hosts. So thank you to everyone at Tiffin and buy Tiffin filters. <laughs> Just kidding, but you can buy Tiffin filters. Um, so anyway, after our big debut at NAB and then following up with a little showcase at Cine Gear, we really had to get down to the hard nitty gritty work of making the next lenses. So do you want to talk for, about that for a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we decided that we were going to, I think, make a 40 and a 100 millimeter. That was something that was very important for us is to choose the right focal lengths. And as you can see here, just, uh, you know, we haven't shown many images yet. But I think this is the first time you guys are seeing some um, imagery of what it looks like inside of ZMAX, as well as some SolidWorks cutaways that I provided um, just to kind of, you know, open that up for the for some viewing. And um, we set out to design the 40 and the 100 after the 65 and continue to make them more manufacturable. We wanted to make sure that they had um, similar flares, similar look, um, as well as, you know, try to contain them as well as and it's size wise, you know, not to make them overly large, but really just kind of exactly right, the right size. So you have to compromise between optical performance in certain areas, plus benefits of mechanical advantage, you know, not being too heavy, not being um, obnoxiously big. There's a lot of challenges in getting those rays, you know, those ray bundles to fit um, through a, what, what is now 114, you know, OD on the front. And so, yeah. And I'd say, you know, there were a lot of unexpected things. So we started with the 65 because we thought it would be the easiest and um, working with someone with a lot of experience like Scott, you know, going to the 40 Scott's going, you're going to have to make the front end of this huge. And Forrest is like, no, no, I have an idea for that. And what I like to say about that is if you learn to see the world in a different way, the world will show you what you need in order to get to the next step. So, you know, Forrest really had some incredible insight that even someone deeply experienced like Scott couldn't quite see in the same way. And that's the way that we were able to make our wide angle lenses. So we achieved a lot with- um, And that's what you're looking at us on right now. That's, yeah. we're, we're on the 40 <laughs> and the 40 is on the screen also. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And, you know, when you start from nothing, you have to kind of act on instinct and, and say, well, 
these are the ideas I have about certain things. I think the world is like this, but they're just always little things that are over the next horizon that are not initially apparent or obvious that as you go, you pick up these little gems or breadcrumbs um, that show you what's just over the next horizon. And that's to me, one of the most beautiful things. And I, I think I have to credit my grandmother with teaching me that. I mean, if you keep your eyes open and your ear open, you're going to pick up great things and the world will show you where to go and how to go. So, uh, you know, very fortunate to have this opportunity. And then, uh, you know, we've got some great photos here from the archives. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at the slide, we've got, this is that day I was talking about with Chris Probst, ASC, uh, checking out the 65 millimeter prototype and Boris there in front of him and my <laughs> OLED monitor. Doing some marketing, I think. Maybe trying some, to, yeah. <laughs> trying to do some cool shots. Got that on my uh, red camera. I think it was a dragon sensor at that time. I don't remember. Helium? I don't think helium was out yet. Uh, Maybe. Um, and then we got a great picture from Forest Kitchen, uh, lens bashing, putting together a bunch of different optics to mm -hmm. make his own anamorphic lens. And then you can see um, people flooding Tiffin here, checking out our lenses, which was a, you know, it was a treat to feel the excitement. I mean, the, the excitement and energy was palpable, like heart pounding. And then the next year in 2018, we had our own booth down here. Um, which we went for an Art Deco vibe, which kind of goes with our brand aesthetic. So, you know, briefly, I could talk about some of the tough stuff that we face trying to start a lens company and make lenses. Um, the things that are really challenging, I would say, are the, like coming up with the correct design parameters first, um, selecting the right materials and making sure that the materials not only perform correctly optically, but that they're available and that they don't have uh, Achilles heel properties that are going to make them a huge pain in the ass after you start making lenses with them. There's some things about certain glass types that make them harder to work with than others. Um, trying to get the right purchasing volume for, you know, glass, raw materials, aluminum, plastic, steel, and then maintaining a level of precision and accuracy as you're manufacturing the components and then building them up and assembling them and the scale, you know, how do you, um, when we started the company, it was just Forrest and I and Scott and that's it. So we had to figure out a lot of things for a small company. And, you know, we're fortunate to have grown a tremendous team of people. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute because, you know, we have the challenges up top and then we talk about the things that help make those challenges easier. But, um, and, you know, if you don't have the tools already to start making these things, you have to either figure out how to get access to those tools or figure out how to make those tools yourself. Things like T-stop machines or uh, focal plane microscopes, projectors, auto collimators, all the tools you need to assemble the lens up correctly and then make sure it's focusing right and working right. Mm -hmm. And then to do that repeatedly day after day after day uh, to meet the demand. And then some of the things that help us along the path are passion you know i think if we if either of us cared even one percent less than we do about this it would be a thousand percent harder so i think it's really the passion that helps keep us daily involved in making sure that things are going in the right direction that they're working correctly um the people we have a tremendous team of people both deeply experienced people and novice people and i think that's something that having a beginner's mind, no matter what level you're at of experience is important. Being willing to learn from someone who's just started as well as hopefully teach people who've just started what you've learned so far. Um, Co-mentorship is really valuable and essential here. And then developing a repeatable process. So, you know, if you go into something with determination, but no process, you're going to work really hard. And then I think it's Adam Savage who said something like the difference between science and just screwing around is writing it down. So you really have to like screw around a little bit and then write down what you've done and then come back to it the next day and refine it and get a little bit better. Um, and practice, you know, thousands and thousands, 10,000 hours, hopefully of practice all day, every day 
focusing on what we're doing, no pun intended, and uh, pragmatism, just to be pragmatic. And, you know, there are going to have to be compromises, but hopefully what you're not compromising is the essential things. Um, so picking and choosing the, the most important things to focus on um, is what I would call pragmatism. And then uh, we'll just show a couple, we're not going to show you any videos, but these are just some of our favorite projects over the last few years to highlight. Um, we've got Thank You Next, the Ariana Grande video, which was a huge success uh, from Christopher Probst ASC. Um, this tremendous music video called F Major by Hani Arani. Uh, American Gods season two and season three used our lenses a lot. And Brendan Stacy uh, and Boris Morsovsky from uh, Canada did Titans, a lot of Titans with our lenses. Um, so these are some of our favorite larger scale projects recently, but there's countless projects. Uh, we don't have time to count them all, but I'll tell you, I do try to watch every project that I come across uh, made with our lenses. Uh, so what's on the horizon for us? Um, hopefully more blue ocean. You know, I think we look at blue ocean as something that other people aren't necessarily doing. And there's some ton of great lens companies in the world. And that's why when we started out, we said, we're not looking to make the next great spherical lens because there are so many tremendous spherical lenses in the world, whether it's a vintage lens, a vintage stills lens that's modified for cinema, uh, modern stills lenses or modern movie lenses. I mean, spherical lenses, there's no chance that a couple startup guys are gonna make a better spherical lens than some of the majors out there. Uh, there's just so much competition. So we wanted to do something that's blue ocean and not being addressed and taken care of for the people. And we're truly humbled and honored to have a chance to be changing cinematography for the better. Um, and the demand for our product has exceeded even our own wildest expectations. So there still aren't many viable options uh, comparable to what we're doing with the Orion series. And our biggest priority right now is scaling our operations to get all the people that want Orions, their Orions faster and more easily with less friction. Um, and we're also exploring some new concepts and we're gonna hopefully continue to realize our mission, which is anamorphic for all. Cool. So thank you very much. This concludes uh, our presentation covering a little bit of the history and reasons why anamorphic lenses exist and the way that those invisible strings pulled and changed history to affect the way that we decided to become uh, the new anamorphic lens cinematography makers. Cool. So I think we'll, the next part is so some Q&A, yeah. right? Yeah. So we'd love to open up the floor to some Q&A and um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. I think we've had a few questions already. Um, we can maybe, Kevin Fletcher, I believe, no, Drew, Drew Dawson actually was the first to ask. Uh, we can look at that together. So I see a question from Drew Dawson, which is, is Atlas planning on making any detuned sets the way that Sigma, Masterbuilt, and Zeiss have started to tune their sets of lenses? Well, you know, one way to look at it is, uh, it's so hard for us to get the lenses tuned in the first place that it's a fine threshold, right? I mean, I think the idea of detuning is to make them less perfect. And we try to make our lenses have sort of a balanced characteristic. So if you shoot them wide open at a T2, they're going to be a little bit more bloomy with a little bit more spherical aberration than most lenses at a T2. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I mean, in a way they come pre, <laughs> in a weird way they come pre detuned de by certain standards. If you look at it, like you want those attributes wide open, um, one would shoot at a T2 constantly. Um, but, but you never know. I mean, we have, we might have some pretty cool tricks up our sleeve that are different than what everyone else yeah. is doing. Let's keep your eyes. One, one thing we do here is we definitely are considerate and exploring lots of options. Um, a lot of things are on the table that we consider and um, while we may not be able to answer all questions directly in regards to those 
those types we have considered um we, we we've had that request i think yeah, before doing something special yeah making a more a little special for a unique purpose so i think that's a it's a good idea and then kevin fletcher second street's question is there a plan for a set that is detuned perhaps moving more toward todd AOs. What is it about the Tadeos that you love? I mean, I love the Tadeos too, but what are the characteristics specifically about Tadeos that hit you? We'll come back to that when I hear from you. Um, Jay, right now, the wait time for the lens is almost a year. Is there a plan to reduce the wait time from Alice? The plan has been since day one to have as little wait time as possible. And maybe customers who are waiting right now have been waiting about a year, but our goal is to knock on wood, by the end of this year, catch up to all the existing orders that are with us until today, if that makes sense. Um, so our goal has never been for the wait time to be very long, but a couple of things, a couple of unexpected things happened along the way. Um, we've had to grow our company to figure out how to do that better. And we're constantly engaged in improving the company and improving the process to make it faster. But then unfortunately the pandemic happened and um, I'm just thankful we've managed to figure out a way to adjust and keep things working and operating through the pandemic and keep our team safe, um, but still operational and functional. So um, the best news I can tell you is that we're not going anywhere. We're not about to go out of business. We're not going away. Uh, we're gonna keep everyone here safe and employed and we're gonna pull through this. and. You know, no one has a crystal ball where they can predict when there will be a vaccine, when we'll be able to stop this global pandemic. But I think all of us have an opportunity and a responsibility to do our best on an individual level to support the humans around us and, and hopefully keep them safe and healthy too. So without being on too much of a soapbox, I think we're gonna make it and we're doing our best to speed up delivery times. You wanna take the next one? Sure. Um, let's see. I'd love to see a comparison with these lenses on a film camera. It'd be interesting to do side by side with some of the classics. Um, if anyone can get to the AFI website later on, um, they just published a lot of the students' uh, visual essays. I have a friend who's at AFI right now. I know of two projects that were shot on film with Atlas lenses. Uh, they're shot on Super 35 anamorphic or you know Super 35 format for perf and they look quite nice. I think one is called passengers, no, no something, tra there's people on a subway. Let's just put it, there's something like that. I have to get the artist names maybe later on. I'll post them up in the chat here for everyone to see. Those are two examples of some projects that recently I just saw that were shot on film. You're right, there's not a lot out there that isn't digital. Um, so it was nice to see. And um, you know, Michael, I don't know what you think, but maybe we can figure out a way to make this a project, if not for next Pacific Northwest Lens Summit with Kerner Camera, maybe sometime before that, um, we can figure out some kind of way to do a side-by-side -side on a film camera, uh, Atlas with other vintage anamorphics and modern anamorphics like master anamorphics. And uh, maybe we can get the glass work guys uh, to send the lens and we can do on film comparison of as many, you know, the, um, the share grid people did a anamorphic lens test a couple years ago and that was really cool. But I think it's been enough years now that it might be time to do something new and different and also to do it on a film camera. Um, so maybe we can figure out a way to do that together. I don't know. What yeah, it sounds think. fun. A little off the cuff, just tossing it. Yeah. Up. Yeah. Never know. <laughs> do you want to, do you want to chat about your, uh, I know you came out with an extender as well that not too long ago and, yeah, I'd love to get into that in a second. Okay. I see that we have a question from Sean Rawls too, which is what is Blue Ocean? So Blue Ocean is just a philosophical idea. Of... Uh, the Glassworks guys would love to join the film tests. Uh, Hi, David. <laughs> hey, David. If you ever organize a test, of course, let us know and we would love to join. Cool. Awesome, thank you. Um, to answer Sean's question about blue ocean. So blue ocean is just a philosophical idea of a space that is not taken by someone else. So it's a uninterrupted new territory, if you will. Um, 
So untapped market. Untapped. In a way. Yeah, untapped water is untapped market. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people talk about blue sky thinking, which is like, you know, there's no roof over your head. You can think in the blue sky as high as you want. And blue ocean is, you know, someone else's made up philosophical idea of unmuddied waters or un, uncontested space. Um, Tom. Hey, Tom. Nice to see you from Brain Cell. Uh, what is the status of the 25 millimeter? So we made a 25 millimeter prototype that we showed uh, back in NAB 2019 and Cine Gear 2019. And I think we actually won at NAB one of the best products in the show with that uh, prototype. Mm-hmm. And after building it and testing it, we took a lot of feedback. So a little bit different approach than we've done in the past, which is with the the first six lenses, the A set and the B set, we knew we needed to get these lenses out together as quickly as possible, as possible. But with the 25, we're taking a little bit more measured approach and taking a lot more feedback um, from end users in the market to make sure that what we do with that actually meets everyone's needs as best as possible. So um, I can tell you that we have one prototype that is on a film in Germany right now. And when that film comes out, I can actually name it for everyone. But up until then we have an NDA and um, hopefully we'll hear more about that soon. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we're hoping to have some announcement about that probably early next year. We also slowed that down because of the pandemic. So, you know, again, it's about being pragmatic and focusing on the core values first. Right, I mean, focusing on our current demand too and for the customers, it's something that you have to weigh a lot of options and um, focus was basically on delivering our current product and making, you know, keeping that aware in the company. So, uh, yeah, we'll share. Yeah. But we we're, we're, we're going to be happy to it's share more happening. about that soon. It's yeah, still happening. We're, we're just as eager as everyone else, I think. And so that's an interesting thing is we, we also are going to, you know, as soon as we can, we're going to share more information about that. Yeah. 25 millimeter. And I see a question from Farhan Alam. Hi, I placed my order back in 2019, June, and it's been a year and I still haven't received it yet. Can you tell us the current delivery status? Uh, Farhan, absolutely. The best way to find out what the status of your order is, is to send us an email at info at atlaslensco.com. Our team will be more than happy to tell you the status of your order and approximately how long you might be waiting before it's shipped. And anyone who has a pre-order in, Generally, the answer would be the same if you're wondering when yours is going to ship. Our team has a tremendous system for providing feedback about that through the email. And one of the great things about what we do is that while we do take pre-order deposits, like many of the other manufacturers, um, our deposits are 100% fully refundable at any time prior to delivery. So if you find that you are fiscally unavailable to keep the reservation in, we can make sure you get your deposit back. And that's something that we're going to honor and take care of. Um, And then to talk about uh, the LF extender, which is something that Mr. Kerner brought up. Um, So our lenses are designed to cover a 24.89 by 18.66, approximately four per film gate aperture. And with some of the newer sensors like the Red Monstro, the Airy LF and others, including the Sony Venice, um, people have been asking, well, how can I make your lenses cover these newer sensors from edge to edge, even if that's gonna be a format that's outside of standard 2.4 delivery. So we actually uh, are offering an LF extender, which is a, sort of like a telephoto extender, but it also expands the image. So it can work, if you're using it on a 35 millimeter format camera, it works as an extender so you can get longer effective focal lengths. So your 80 becomes a 127 and your 100 becomes about a 160 and you lose a stop in a third of light. And if you use it on a larger format camera, um, it expands the image, the the sweet spot of the image 1.6 times. So Mm -hmm. you're going to get edge to edge coverage on any of the LF or full frame uh, sensors. And the beauty of this is you basically, if you can only afford one lens, you can get two lenses in one by having this extender. And the other great thing is um, we're gonna be offering uh, in the second week of July, 
a version of the LF extender that has a native LPL mount. So you'll be able to skip the LPL to PL adapter that's included with the Aerie LF cameras and LF mini cameras. Um, so that way you're not going from the base mount to an adapter, to an extender, to a lens. You're gonna be able to go camera, LF extender with LPL mount, and then lens. And our LF extender works with a variety of other lenses, uh, many zooms, a uh, variety of different primes, but it's optimized for our lenses. So um, it's tuned to get the best results with our lenses. And we have another question coming in from Withis. Would you consider filtration that cut the predominant blue flares? Got both sets and depending on the project, the flares could be sometimes a bit distracting. Great question. Um, this is something that we believe is possible up to the user in a way. So depending on which camera system you're using and the way that your um, color correction is handled either with a LUT or with the color balance of the camera and the color of the light source, the blueness of the flares will vary depending on your lighting conditions, um, your camera setup, even your ISO. So the level of saturation can be adjusted or tuned depending on your lighting as well as your color correction. And because those flares live in a part of the spectrum that's um, peaked in blue, you're gonna have the ability to control through your primary and secondary color correction um, a way to make them slightly different color. If you wanna get crazy, you could even key them to be a different color, but you can really truly attenuate the level of saturation and uh, luminance of those flares on your own. Um, you could also potentially cut them a little bit using a variety of different color filters. So we don't have a plan to offer our own color filters. I would say um, check out things like an enhancer. Um, maybe check out something like a tobacco or suede filter. Maybe Michael, maybe you have some res, uh, recommendations or some, some other members of the group have recommendations uh, that you're welcome to throw in the chat for different flares. I know like suede and tobacco filters became less popular probably 10 years ago. So you could probably pick those up secondhand really cheaply. Um, and maybe they have a second life as a purpose for that. But as far as like offering lenses with different flare styles, um, this is a question that we get a lot. So we hope to be addressing that in some way or another sooner or later. Uh, Market Commander and Jay, please give Oksana a raise. She is doing amazing. Well, we gave her a raise and we'll tell her. <laughs> and thanks for the kind words. Um, ba, ba, ba. Cornelius Hurley says, shooting film with Atlas this summer, FYI. All right, can't wait to see what you make, Cornelius. Uh, Shadi says, I did lots of feature movies on Atlas and everyone loves them. Any plans on going LF? Shadi, thank you for being a customer. Good to see you out there. And at the moment, um, the best way to go LF is with our LF extender, but uh, you know, you never know what's coming in the blue ocean. We're, we're evaluating a lot of different design considerations and ideas right now in-house here. Uh, 230829, can you talk about your approach to lens coating? Forrest, do you wanna talk about the coatings a little bit? Sure, yeah, I mean, the, the approach was, as we mentioned prior, um, to take sort of a vintage look at how can we accomplish coatings that are reminiscent of the past. Um, so we, we decided to go with a, you know, a particular coating of, of the single single layer. And that's kind of predominantly why you get these flares that are typical in, the, in these classic lenses. Um, they flare much more than if you were to say, apply a modern multi-coating that you know attenuates a lot of that flaring. Um, that was something that we agreed upon that we want to, we want to let the flares happen. So when you want to engage them, hit them with a strong source, um, they're going to happen. And Shadi also says, are there any plans going beyond 100, like 135 or a macro lens? Um, never say never, but again, if you need to go a little more telephoto, that LF extender is gonna be a good friend to you. And I've tested um, using things like a Century Doubler, which is a, uh, Century Doubler is usually like a rehoused Nikon or Canon extender um, to go even further. And I've even stacked a, a Century Doubler with the 1.6 expander before. Um, so that's pretty cool. 
Got Tito and, in the chat. Oh yeah, one more thing about the Aleph right. extender. It doesn't affect your minimum focus. So you're still going to get, uh, you're going to be more punched in, but you're going to still have that same short, close focus distance. So you're going to be able to get even closer using the Aleph extender. So in a sense that can kind of act as a pseudo macro, depending on how close you need to get. Um, and then we got another question from Tito. You want to take that one? Sure, Tito. Hey, hey, Tito. Hey. I'm a fan too. Yep. Tito writes. Tito Fair Dance here. We got uh, any plans on teaming up with content creators that share the mission of Anamorphic for All? Um, that's a big yes. Uh, we are certainly open to, you know, supporting any creator and and figuring out how we can work with them. And you know, Tito, you're you're always welcome here. Doors are open, but we'll also work with you at any location you're at. So just kind of hit us a message on the side. And we'll talk to you. And we have a question from Steve Boyce. What plans do you have for an anamorphic zoom range? That's a fantastic question. And I'm going to just come right out and say, we would love to do anamorphic zooms. It's not yet in the cards because as a startup, it's not our area of expertise yet. So we feel like we have to really tr stay true to what we're trying to do first and foremost before we go too far. And that way we don't over leverage ourselves, but um, we would love to offer something that is similar in performance and style to the Orions, but with the ability to zoom. So yeah, we'd love to do that. Uh, Meg Valiant says, will there be a list of the other lenses that the extender is verified to work with available? That's a great idea. We should crowdsource uh, a list. I mean, I've tested it with all of my personal lenses, so I might as well, I have a significant lens yeah. collection. Another way to do this, and, and this is just for anybody, because there's a, I mean, there's probably an unlimited amount of lenses people might be curious about is we could publish the dimensions of the, of the actual fitment so that you can actually print or, you know, take a gauge from online dimensions, check it against your lenses and your current inventory. If it fits, it usually works. I mean, that's a big yeah. thing of the thing. So if it just mechanically will fit into the extender. And some work optically better than others. So like a lot of the primes, you're going to have to stop down probably one stop mm. so far in my experience. But, um, if you email us, I mean, we'll put this on the website soon, but if you email us, we actually have the, the throat dimensions of the LF extender, so we can give those to anyone who asks. Um, but it gets a little more complicated sometimes with like sphere collaboration of certain lens designs. Sure, I, yeah. There's, you know. Work, the works, I guess. We would yeah. love to make an uh, extended database about this. It's just, I don't know how much time we have yet. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. But we'll find time. I, I think it's a great question. Yeah. Mike Carter, what is the stop loss on the extender expander? I believe that's a third stop. One and one third stop. One and one third. Yeah, one Sorry. and one third stop. And um, if anyone wants to just start speaking to us, uh, we're welcoming the opportunity yeah. to, to just don't yell at each other. Yeah, just but, open uh, your you mic can, up and, yeah, you and can come on down. Yeah. Come on out and ask. Hey guys, uh, this is Max from Exo Optics speaking to you from Ukraine. I'm a, a huge fan of yours. I've been following Forrest's work from, uh, you know, hand grinding cylinders on his porch days. <laughs> um, and uh, um, I've been hosting a little kind of Zoom thingy uh, myself uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it was late at night for me. And, uh, you know, after it was done, I went straight to bed. And then Zoom sent, sent me an email that uh, Dan Keynes is in your waiting room. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I rushed back to my computer, but uh, you were already gone. So uh, sorry, Dan, uh, I missed you or you missed the, the thing just a, a couple of hours. My um, bad, sorry to wake you. <laughs> <laughs> All good. And you're um, rehousing uh, ISCO lenses, right? The ISCO? Um... Correct, ISCO yeah. Ramos, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's correct. Awesome. Um, I have a bunch of uh, like uh, technical questions, but when I was thinking like what I would love to ask, um, I thought that uh, I, I really wonder um, when you transform your passion into a business and uh, you know, from the story that you told us today, it came quite natural to you, it seems. Um, but I was wondering, does it, uh, does it take away from, you know, like the romantic aspect of things, you know, uh, um, and that's, uh, I think that's the question to both of you, uh, to Forrest as well, since you've been, uh, you know, tinkering with lenses and doing all this kind of uh, DIY stuff first, and then you went on a much more serious level. And now, obviously, it's a business. Uh, 
does it does it take away uh, from the fun, or do you find it tough to kind of balance, uh, you know, the the fun aspect and the business uh, aspect of things? Thank sure. you. I'll answer first. Yeah, yeah. I mean. I, I actually wouldn't say it takes away from that romantic feeling and that, that passion, that fun that you have with it. Uh, it certainly does reduce maybe the times you're able to experience that feeling of romanticism with the project you're engaged in just, just because sometimes, you know, uh, logistics come up, you have to answer emails, you have to work on something that you get so focused in that you're not really feeling that moment in, you know, in that, in that daily work. But then there's other moments that completely balance that out, you know, a, a sense of discovery, those things that are that, you know, even when you're not doing it as a business, those are the, the sense of discovery and that exploration, those sense of passion, that, that's what comes back. It's the same feeling. And so it doesn't change. It doesn't go away. But I could say it's more in like a measured capacity of <laughs> when can I experience these things? Because you have to be honest, there's a lot more work, you know, when you're doing it as a business. And um, you kind of have to divide and pay attention to that. Yeah, I mean, for me, the romance that has suffered the most from this business, unfortunately, is my marriage. Um, it's having a business like this is tough on a family. Um, also, at the same time, like when we when we debuted the 65 millimeter prototype, um, my wife was pregnant with our first child, my daughter Zoe. And so many changes were happening in my life at the same time. So I've just gotten used to change after change after change. And, um, and then my son just turned six months old, Max, and just now. And um, it's amazing because, I mean, I can measure the business in terms of next to the scale of their lives. So my daughter is about to turn three years old. So it's basically, you know, putting those two things side by side, those, those changes in my life were happening at the same time. And it's really crucial to me that I make sure my children and my wife get my attention. Um, but you could accuse me of monomania for sure. Monomania is obsession with one thing. I'm 100% insanely obsessed with lenses and I'm absolutely obsessed and insane about this company. And I'll just come right out and throw myself under the bus. I'm a complete monomaniac about this. Um, I love it. So I think it's about figuring out a way to, when I'm with my family, not be engaged in the business and not be thinking about the business. And that's the biggest challenge. Um, but as far as my fuel and desire for what we do, it's like a Molotov cocktail. I mean, I, I'm head over heels a maniac for this. I love it more than anything else. So um, I never feel uninspired about this business, <laughs> except, you know, there's, there are times actually where I go, well, there's some challenges we're facing. I don't know how we're going to face them exactly, but I know I'll figure it out. So that's, that's my take on it. I mean, I'm, I've never felt uninspired about this business. I love it but I do want to make sure that I give my family what they need and deserve as well. Thanks. Great answers. I hope your inspiration never leaves you. Thank you. Thanks. I had one question on the side. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. yeah uh, that's from a hero. It says, um, how I used to make smaller versions of anamorphic lenses, would it be possible? Uh, would that be possible from Atlas Lens Co? And that's a good question. Um, Kawa, you know, as a, a comparison, let's just say they're smaller and someone, you know, you might notice that there's some distortion, some interesting things happening, especially at the edges of frame. That is a compromise to the size that they were made. Um, as you squeeze down uh, the package size of let's say an optical assembly or system and you're still maintaining a two times squeeze, you are really forcing a lot of bending of light um, to the point where undoing some of those effects is going to basically have a compromise, which is you can get the image to come into focus at the expense of distortion. Um, with ours, we decided that we needed to 
balance distortion a little bit better than that. Um, one of the things that I um, have seen in the past is an ununiform squeeze across the frame. Again, that's just a, a portion of distortion, but it's anamorphic distortion distinctly because it looks like you have more squeeze at the edge than you do in the middle. And we paid close attention to that. So in order to achieve a more uniform squeeze across the frame, that meant we had to elongate, you know, some portion of the anamorphs and that was, that's why they're a little bit bigger. Yeah. Never say never on trying to make something a little bit smaller, but um, I love the cowl lenses. They just have their own unique flavor. Sure. And if you watch films shot with them, um, one I can think of right off the top of my head is a film called Soul Searching, which is about um, some Korean American kids who go to Korea to get immersed in Korean culture in Korea. And they use the 40 Kawa a lot in that film. And I was watching it with my wife and I'm like, oh, this was definitely Kawa because the edges, they put the characters on the edges and they're like extra skinny. And then they walk into the center of the frame and they're, they change dimension. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just one of those things that it's, it's a tool mark from the lens. So, you know, it's that lens. And, and I think that's awesome. Yeah. Those lenses have their own purpose, but it's different than what we were going with for the Orions. So, um, but yeah, never say never. I mean, there's always the possibility of us making something smaller in the future. Yep. And Tito says, Cali used to use synchro focus designs, which affects how the squeeze factor changed over the focus range. It's also true. Um, like Lomo, the Kawa lenses, they use a dual focus system. So there's like a floating group that changes as you focus. Um, and then Fazakas Gurgli says, hi, thank you very much for this presentation. Is there a possibility to see and test the lenses in Germany? Absolutely. Um, if you email us, we can recommend some rental houses in Germany. And hopefully after the pandemic is over, maybe we can visit uh, an event like Cynic in Munich. Mm -hmm. And if you go to our site, there's also a section uh, where we, if, if you're a owner operator or a rental house who carries our lenses, um, as a thank you to those people and companies that carry the lenses, if you would like to be featured on our referral list, um, email us and we'll make sure that you are on that list of where you can access the lenses. So um, we do have a variety of, of um, rental houses and owner operators in Germany who could even show you, even during the pandemic, the lenses, hopefully. Yeah, we welcome more questions if anyone wants to jump on mic, that's also okay. Hello from Switzerland. This is Gavin from with us. Hey. Hi. <laughs> um, I have both of your sets and there is something that I would like to point out and that is uh, to my surprise, uh, your lenses hardly ever going to need uh, diopters. How could you, how did you accomplish the, the close focus? That was very surprising to me when I was working with other anamorphics, even mo more modern. It was not even close to what you guys accomplished. Yeah. First of all, thank you. I mean, that's a tremendous compliment. And um, I believe what you're highlighting is the amazing close focus capability of the lenses. And a lot yes. of that has to do with, in the design phase, optimizing for that close focus ability, which is something we focused on, right. no pun intended. Yeah, that, that goes back to, um, again, an amount of figuring out how close you want to focus and then and ultimately sort of pushing the design and finding that area of compromise. I would say traditional optical design people are afraid to let certain things happen because they might fear that it compromises, you know, the resolution or they might compromise something about the performance to where they'll put a cap and say, that's enough. Because if you do that, you know, the image might degrade. Uh, we explored solutions and ways to control those aberrations, but also embrace some of that effect that you get more spherical aberration or something as you cl focus closer. Field curvature, for instance. Yeah. So we find that if you're doing something truly, truly close up, um, you're probably concerned about something that's closer to the center frame. So if you have a right. little bit of field curvature, which is the change of uh, focus position throughout the field. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if the, if the center is focused at three feet, the sides might be focused at two and a half feet. That's an example. Of, right. Would you say that's negative field curvature because the sides are closer? Because you can have uh, positive yeah. field curvature or negative field curvature. Right. Um, I don't know I which, what debatable. side, but it's, it's, yeah, there's field curvature. 
um, there, it, it, it'll change over the course of how you where you're focused to. And, you know, one other thing is, of course, you know, that's, that's the limitations really are physics, you know, the longer focal lengths can't focus as close as easily, uh, you know, the lens would have to ultimately become bigger or longer or something to accommodate because uh, just the nature of wide angle versus telephoto and how they focus. Um, but they ultimately give a look that we were looking to achieve, which is you're, you're balancing that area of frame that you're concerned with to keep in focus and to maintain resolution, to maintain a particular look. And I think that goes well with the tradition of anamorphic. Uh, we're used to seeing aberrations on the top and the bottom of frame. And we knew that that was something that wouldn't be afraid to explore that. So in the design phase, that all started. That had to, that had to be fixed in the design phase. If not, you can't um, really go much further once you put it together. Something I had in an older version of the slide deck was uh, all lenses are compromise. It's a, an exercise in compromise. And then anamorphic lenses just add an extra dimension of compromise that you have to take into consideration during the design phase. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Hero also says, funny you mentioned soul searching. I worked with the director. Awesome. I like that film. It was fun. It's touching. Thank you for that answer. And um, I would even consider saying that part of the charm of anamorphics is not just to be reminiscent to what we know with film, but I also think the funkiness, like Cook is explaining in their in their adverts, I think this is this is part of the reason why I chose your optics is because it has character. I, I'm not looking for clean, purposefully image uh, in many ways. I think one of the things aside of filtration and obviously how you uh, film something, uh, the, the real thing that I, that I see with those lenses is it takes also the edge of digital and it, it adds a, a certain charm and uh, I'm very happy that I own your sets and I'm looking forward to using them more often. Um, thank you. Yeah. yeah thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, but I sort of like to do it at the end of these. Uh, thanks so much, you guys. This was great, really educational well put together and a uh, nice discussion at the end. Honored to have Atlas and you guys on Lens Summit. And uh, something that's- an honor and a privilege to be yeah, here. Yeah, it's a super fun thing. Um, something I like to do sort of at the end of these things is sort of go around the world and see what's going on in different markets. And uh, we've got Max Swan from the Ukraine was on. Max, how are things there? Um, sorry, are you speaking in regards of- uh, Just like production. Production. Pandemic, yeah. Right. Uh, well, things certainly slowed down a bit here. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the places that I work with, I'm operating on a really small scale, though. So it's a very different kind of uh, business from Atlas. Um, you know, like the production house that I'm cooperating with, uh, they focus on um, like really high volumes, larger clients. I'm a very kind of small client for them, but uh, uh, the pandemic kind of took away a lot of their uh, major uh, clients. So they have a little bit more time for me and things were finally set in motion recently. Um, so, you know, I guess it's a, it's a give and take. Right. Yeah. And then uh, we have uh, Gavin from Switzerland with, with us. <laughs> Well, it's there. been a bit yeah. quiet here in Switzerland. Uh, a lot of uh, work is being outsourced, unfortunately, because the film market is not as big and it's a bit of unfortunate. So I don't know if the pandemic has really uh, changed a lot because uh, it had been slow before. <laughs> so I'm mainly focusing on foreign markets so far, it's been been okay. Not great. It could better. It could be better. <laughs> right. Seems like a lot of the markets are starting to bounce back a little bit. 
Yeah, I agree. Anybody else want to contribute? Uh, yeah, uh, Chitta Fahadang's here from Vancouver. We are just starting to get back into production. Most MOWs are uh, resuming on this Monday. And people are still very concerned. There has been new uh, union courses and safety checks for people to get used to the new protocols about keeping the pandemic in check. But Vancouver has been doing pretty well compared to the rest of Canada. And everybody's kind of worried that it'll start spreading again. But at the same time, the market can't be closed forever. Things shut down completely in the beginning of March. Right, that's what I've been saying. I think once we start opening up, it's going to be hard to close back down. I don't think people will be uh, wouldn't want, want to do that again, even though it could be necessary. Uh, anyway, well, thanks so much for uh, showing up again this week. We had a good showing of about 150 people, and uh, you know we'll see you next week. We have Master Built on. Tim and Lisa are going to be. Uh, discussing master belt lenses and look out for a uh, uh, event right invitation and tell your friends. And we should have these guys, uh, this will be recorded. Uh, the recording will be on uh, my website as well as Atlas's. I have one more question for everyone out there. Um, if there's something that you want in a cinema lens that doesn't exist yet, that is your dream lens or something that's just not out there, feel free to type into the chat what you want and mm -hmm. make a wish and if we can do it we'll try <laughs> and if you can't come up with it now feel free to reach us on anytime uh, yeah email or social media kind of throw your ideas at us i mean just in case and you know once again thank you everyone out there stay safe um support your fellow humans black lives matter uh it's pride month so take care of your fellows and be good to each other. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Michael, you. for this opportunity. Yeah, we appreciate everybody out there. All Stay right. Well. Uh, yep. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody.